Welcome to Smash Fiction, a podcast where we pit two or more fictional characters against one another in a battle of losing souls and finding souls and apparently having some kind of grudge against my soul and see who would win. <laughs> this week, Raziel versus Alucard. I don't know if anyone will hear this. I know it's our last Smash Toma Fest, but I had to tell someone. I didn't mean to bring all this about. I was only trying to help my podcast. Poor thing's been sick for years. I've, I've managed to keep it under control until now while I conducted my experiments, but it's even more full of crap than I realized, and it's getting worse. It's getting so much worse. Soon it will break free. I must, I must prevent that from happening. I must finish what I started all those years ago. Wait, where did, where? God forgive me. Yeah! Ah! Raziel wasn't the type to easily give in to hopelessness, but he had to admit that he was starting to get worried. He had been in this prison cell for... he didn't even know how many days. He had nothing to track time by. He didn't remember how he had gotten here, and since his arrival, nobody else had arrived to tell him. The door had remained resolutely shut, and no sounds could be heard from outside. He did have a cellmate, at least, a man with equally vague notions of how he had come to be here, but Raziel had stopped talking to him after discovering that he was hopelessly and irredeemably emo. Mm. <laughs> In short, Raziel had no idea where he was, how he had gotten here, or how to get out, and it didn't look like that cell door was just going to magically open anytime soon. The cell door magically opened. <gasps> <laughs> Raziel looked up swiftly, catching only the briefest glimpse of a vaguely human-shaped figure in the threshold. Then, something clattered to the floor, and the figure disappeared into darkness. The door, however, remained open. Who was that? Alucard asked, flipping his long hair in an attempt at appearing nonchalant. What just happened? Cautiously, Raziel opened the door, peering out into the blackness beyond. The door has been opened, he said, raising an eyebrow. We seem to be in the good graces of a benefactor as mysterious as our circumstances. What's that? Alucard asked. <laughs> you know I can never understand you behind that stupid mask of yours. That's why I stopped talking to you. Who opened the door? Raziel sighed. I do not know, but they appear to have left us a gift. Alucard picked up the fallen object. It's a scroll, he said, unrolling it. Not much light to read it by. Fortunately, a vampire has no need of such things. Mm -hmm. Raziel's eyes widened. You're a vampire, he said. So am I. Well, depending on your definition. I've definitely been brought back to life a few times. I suppose you might say I am a fellow member of the fraternity of Knight's Creatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no idea what you're talking about, Alucard said, his eyes scanning the scroll. Raziel peeked over his shoulder. At the top, in large, friendly, Old English font letters, it said, Verily, refrain from panicking. Yeah! <laughs> no sooner had the words been read than the scroll began to glow brightly. Surprised, Alucard dropped it. Magical light danced and played around the room, and when it was finished, a translucent, mostly featureless face shimmered in the air. Hello, it said cheerfully. Thank you for unrolling this scroll, and welcome to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gothic Sea. <laughs> <laughs> the what? Raziel asked. Great question, the face said. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gothic Sea contains all the information you could ever possibly need about every gothic setting that exists in the multiverse. Just ask me anything about this or any other world that could reasonably be described as gothic and I will answer it. Okay, Alucard said. What's the name of this world? It actually doesn't have one, the face replied. Another great question, though. You guys are just full of those. Mm. It doesn't have a name, Raziel repeated. Very well, then. Tell us about this world. I'd be happy to, the face chirped. Long ago, in the Age of the Ancients, this world was a homogenous gray place ruled by dragons. This ended with the appearance of the so-called First Flame, which gave life to human-like creatures called Hollows. It is very easy to beat them in a drinking contest. Four of these hollows, led by one called Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, who collected <laughs> sources of power called the Lord Souls, and embarked upon a crusade that slew all the dragons. 
This began the Age of Fire, during which the Hollows, which are basically humans, but with less tolerance for alcohol, built up vast, sprawling civilizations. We are currently, right now, around the end of the Age of Fire, as the first flame is growing dangerously close to flickering out altogether, which has caused a great plague of undeath to begin sweeping through humankind. Many humans revive upon death here, and the more they do so, the less human and the more mindless they become. Gwyn has done everything he can to extend the lifespan of the first flame, including throwing himself into it to keep it lit, which has only delayed its ultimate demise and transformed him into the Lord of Cinder. Raziel's ears perked up. Is that why we have been brought here then, he asked, to find some way of reviving this first flame and saving this world. Boy, that's sure a great theory, the face said. <laughs> if you're some kind of world-saving hero type, as I know for a fact you are, it certainly wouldn't be a bad idea to find the Lord Souls, which are still kept by Gwyn's allies, go to the Kiln of the First Flame, and battle Gwyn for succession. Of course, you'd have to fight your way through various monsters and numerous deadly hazards just to get to Gwyn, and then there's Gwyn himself, who is awfully large and fiery these days. Plus, you don't really have any equipment or powers at the moment, though you might pick some up along your journey. But on the plus side, if you die, your soul will just abandon the dead body and reanimate the nearest corpse, right? That's your whole deal? Raziel nodded. It is so. And for the sake of the souls of this fallen world, this is a quest I have no choice but to undertake. Hold on a second, Alucard says. I'm just as much a hero as you are. Why do you get all the quests? I bet I could find the Lord Souls and defeat this Gwyn character better and faster than you could. I'm sorry, can you transform nearby corpses into your old body every time you die? Raziel asked coldly. Uh, no, when I die, I turn into this awesome mist, find the last coffin I slept in, and hang out there until I heal, Alucard said, which is much cooler and way less gross than yours. <laughs> You couldn't save this world if it was the last world in the multiverse, which apparently exists, Raziel snapped. <laughs> Could too, Alucard retorted. In fact, I'm going to start right now. Fine, Raziel snapped back. You know, the face said, you two could always work together. But Raziel and Alucard had already left the cell and stormed down the hallway in opposite directions. Huh, the face said. The boss isn't going to like that one bit. He was really hoping they would do this thing as a team. I wonder if he has any idea which one of these strapping vampire lads will be able to complete the story of Dark Souls before the other one has a chance. Don't look at me, you weird scroll. I'm not the boss of anyone. <laughs> least of all your unsubtle plot device ass. <laughs> I don't even know who either of these characters are. But I do know some people who are curious about the answer to your question, so I guess I can help figure it out. I'm Miles Schneiderman, and I can't fucking believe I got roped to judging another stupid video game match. <laughs> it was that would you, rather, advocate, would you rather advocate for one, Miles? I'm just going to point out that Kit's not here and leave it at that. <laughs> Representing Raziel from the Legacy of Cain are Dan Mulcairin. Ooh, Soul Reaver, I believe that you can win these fights. Ooh, Soul Reaver, cause even for a vampire, Alucard really bites. No. <laughs> <laughs> And Claire Mulcairin. No time for jokes this week. The Legacy of Cain has a lot of weird lore, and we need to get Miles up to speed to prepare for this match. So we need to put in terms that Miles understands. The plot of Soul Reaver is exactly the plot of Kill Bill, except substitute assassins with vampires, and the bride actually dies instead of fake dying and comes back as a ghost. O'Ren is a giant spider. Vernita Green is a sea monster. Bud is a giant made of metal. Eldriver is a psychic and looks like the monster from Cloverfield. Oh wait, I forgot Melkaya. I guess that's Gogo. -Go? So Gogo's a giant stitched together from a bunch of corpses who can phase through solid matter. And also, Beatrix's Hattori Hanzo sword is the ghost of Bill's Hattori Hanzo sword. And then I guess Soul Reaver 2 is Kill Bill Volume 2, except instead of actually finding Bill, Bill escapes from Beatrix the last moment by traveling back in time, and so Beatrix follows him back in time, and then discovers that she was Bill's Hattori Hanzo sword all along. <sighs> I hope this clears things up. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I feel so much more prepared to judge this now. Thank you, Claire. Representing Alucard from Castlevania are Megan Bob. Do you guys feel that? It's big drac energy. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz Logan. Praise the sun. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. In order to determine who goes first this week, I killed one member of each team and asked the other to bring them back to life. Oh no. 
Dan surprised me by just straight up having an ancient tome with a resurrection spell in his closet and being able to cast it. So it looked like he and Claire were the sure winners. But then Megan and Bob revealed that I hadn't actually managed to kill Liz at all, but rather one of the many clones of herself that she's been growing during her time in space. <laughs> Not only was that extremely clever, but it really seems like Liz is building some kind of army up there. And I certainly don't want to be on the wrong side when it's time to welcome our new Liz over. Overlords. So, <laughs> Team Alucard will be going first. Team Alucard, let's hear your opening Stnemgra. <laughs> yay! 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 You're the best! That will be it in terms of uh, witty and clever transitional uh, jokes <laughs> from, from yours truly. <laughs> Such as it was, it was a busy week. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best I could do. Blonde. Beautiful. <laughs> Powerful and with a sensitive human side. Here comes Alucard, otherwise known as Vampire Jesus. <laughs> if there's any being <laughs> capable of saving humanity from the first flame being extinguished in Dark Souls, it's Alucard. He has the best of both worlds. He's driven and capable, instilled with a desire to protect humanity from evil thanks to his human mother, Lisa, but also has immense strength and fighting spirit thanks to his vampire dad, Dracula. Did you know that's Alucard backwards, Dracula? <laughs> I, I, that was actually the basis for my entire one transitional joke. Cool. So yes, I did. Great, I'm glad I, was I aware just of that. spiked that into the ground like Gronk. You just blew my fucking mind. Liz. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Given all that, nothing would get Alucard harder than being dispatched <laughs> on a mission to protect humanity from being harmed by evil powers. Meanwhile, Raz Ra Razile is easily <laughs> manipulated and generally driven by selfish desires. Ray Raziel needed three games to defeat the Elder God, whereas Alucard needed only one to defeat his world's greatest threats. Alucard's whole deal is protecting the world from the evils his father, Dracula, brings about. And as we all know, Dracula is the strongest vampire in existence. We know this because we had a match with four Draculas against each other, because, you know, uh, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and because Dracula's second in command is death. Death, people. Dracula is literally stronger than death, something or something that we know comes for all of us, even immortals. Alucard has beaten Dracula, therefore he's beaten death, so it just makes sense. I'll just go ahead and say, you know, Dracula's probably the strongest being in the entire universe. How is some other vampire, when Alucard has already beaten the strongest in existence, going to cause him to stumble in his quest at all? Raziel is aimless. When dropped into the world of Dark Souls, he'll probably sit around, wonder what events in his past caused him to now be here, wait for someone to give him a cool sword, and then fail at saving the world, inevitably causing it to be worse off. Think of Rosal getting to the kiln of the first flame, deciding to sacrifice himself to stave off the darkness, but instead of landing on the fire three feet in front of him, he lands in the manure pile next to it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's now talk about some of uh, Alucard's myriad powers. First off, his power of dominance. This ability entails absorbing the souls of defeated monsters and then being able to use their abilities. This is about as OP as it gets when placing another character from a different universe within the world of Dark Souls. In Dark Souls, when a monster is killed, you collect their souls. You can turn these souls in for items or level ups. Alucard will be able to level up tremendously as he works his way through to the kill of the first flame. Meanwhile, Ra Razael will be stuck at level one. Sure, Raz L can find chests with weapons and armor and absorb the souls of bosses, but his stats will be low most of the time, just like the average per-game score put up by the Chicago Bears. Whoa, Liz, you really don't want to win this match, do you? <laughs> Both are expert swordsmen. Alucard still has an advantage over Raz, Raz, and that's his strong magic. Similar to Alucard, the R-word has to obtain relics or glyphs in order to cast magic. But his spells are not very strong and would be considered, like, a half-strength taser bolt to any of the enemies in Dark Souls. I mean, they resist, like, a sword coated in pine tree tar resin, which gives, like, lightning powers. Please. <laughs> to go through the laundry list, or rather Dan's list of spells, Alucard can shapeshift into a wolf bat or miss, each with their own unique power, shoot fireballs, heal from blood, summon spirits, steal health, and give you a nice engraving in your face with his sword. Razile's strength is defined by his sword. Whether it be the Reaver or the Soul Reaver, these blades have offered more hindrance than help throughout his sad, sad life. Zeal is more of a thinker, though a bad one, than a doer, though he does try. 
Rosal is remembered for his tragic and failure-filled plot trajectory, whereas Alucard is known for his repeated successes against the powers of evil. I ran out of ways to say Raziel, but I tried. <laughs> <laughs> but not I once did you say it backwards. Say. Lizar. Lizar. It kind of sounds like Liz, though. Lizard. Lizar. It's actually, yeah, it's, it's like Liz, Lazar. Mm -hmm. Lazar, yeah. yeah. Lazar. Maybe that's how they got Raziel's name. Does he use lasers in the game ever? Uh, no. Don't. No lasers. Mega Bob, continue. Okay. It's because we didn't get enough of this. Long blonde hair. <laughs> Skin made of moonlight. A cape that would make Dante go, shit, I gotta steal that. Eyelashes that were carved from the feathers of angels. A barrel full of dad issues that makes Greek mythology look a little tame, honestly. <laughs> All right, point the first. He goes against his dad. His dad is Dracula, Lord of Vampires, and all-around evil dick. And I don't care if this isn't a game mechanic. I want to talk about the burning heart that leads a half-vampire kid named Adrian to say, I will change my name. So it's the reverse of dad's name to show him I oppose what he stands for. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, the person who can do that is afraid of nothing. Yeah! I can hear my opponents going like, oh, this is some dumb Bob argument. And yes, yeah! it is a dumb Bob argument. <laughs> <laughs> However, Alucard is the light that Dark Souls was waiting for. This fallen world needs someone who fears nothing. Not even the thought of their demonically powerful father going, what the fuck is wrong with you, son? In the movie of this, he's going to descend from the heavens or more practically come out of a coffin glowing with the righteous fury of someone who's going to show their daddy's wrong and that humanity is kind of okay sometimes. A sort of weird, gothimo version of Footloose. <laughs> I will be honest, I have not seen Footloose, but that is what I understand it to be. <laughs> Somebody tell me if that's not the plot. It's good enough. <laughs> Second, magic. The delicious sauce on this little vampiric cream puff. Yum! Do you like your vampire <laughs> Jesuses a little OP? Because this one can stop time. Stop Granted, time. it's for five seconds at a time, but that's five more seconds than the rest of us and five more than Raziel has available to him. I don't know how to describe to you the extent to which stopping the linear progression of lived reality for all beings in your area is a big <laughs> deal. It is the difference between getting in an extra attack, getting to change your weapon, getting to dodge an incoming attack, getting to make sure your hair still looks fucking amazing. Alucard has a stopwatch, and yes, it's called a stopwatch because I guess this version of the 1700s was really into, I don't know, time trials for dying from contaminated water, I don't know. <laughs> but Miles, this is a vampire with the ability to control time. Wait, are, are you telling me that Alucard has a watch? Yeah! He oh, does. No. He can tell time. Oh, shit. <laughs> and once he has it, he will be unstoppable. I mean... <laughs> is it also a communicator, though? Uh, people, people. I mean, it communicates with time, so... Yeah, no, right. Bob, all no. you say is, yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> if somebody asks you whether your watch is also a communicator, <laughs> you say yes! <laughs> He's got weapons. He can dual-wield weapons. He can create a storm of swords, and it is better than George R. R. Martin's book because this one is a literal <laughs> storm of swords. That's some false advertising bullshit. He waves his sword, does a magic, and then suddenly there are like 12 swords coming at the enemy all at once to stab at thee and also show dad he's wrong. Ah! That's one thing he can do. He can also turn into a deadly mist or a wolf or a bat, which is hella cool and probably won't even be noticed by the mooks and dark souls. They're not looking for a wolf, are they? Nah. Hey, what's this bat <laughs> doing here? I don't know, man. Echo locating some insects, probably. No, dude. Don't fucking aim at that bat. Bats are important pollinators and stuff. What the hell is wrong with you, Kyle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kyle. This deadly mist? Oh, it's probably from the moors, you know? <laughs> Always sad, covered in mist, those moors. <laughs> My point is that Dark Souls isn't cut out for this disguise ability. Do they even have object permanence in that game? No. Also, <laughs> his wolf form can outrun a bullet for some reason. So not only a wolf, but what if Superman was a wolf? And the bat form can shoot fireballs. You know, hashtag normal bat things. <laughs> <laughs> Other perfectly normal things he can do that will make it easy for him to stay alive instead of coffin hopping. Summon creatures to harass his enemies for him because obs, he has a world to save. Sometimes you have other things to do and you just need to hire some local ghosts or fairies to come gang up on your enemies. 
look, Miles, you haven't played this game. I haven't played this game. (laughs) I am asking you to try and imagine how on earth this ends without it just being a blonde wolf on a skateboard wearing a stopwatch standing next to the first flame with his gang of ghosts saying to winded Raziel, what, like it's hard? And then (laughs) throwing himself into it after doing a sick ollie. (laughs) Sick edit. <laughs> Is this Tony Hawk? Yeah. Vampire skater. <laughs> Tony Hawk pro staker. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Wow. Sweet 720. Yeah, it's a shame they put that last <laughs> E from skate right in the first flame. Like <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Normally, I would be excited about having such things in my notes as vampire Jesus. <laughs> What if Superman was a wolf and just the word blonde underlined three <laughs> times? But unfortunately, I stopped taking notes after Liz's dig at the Bears, so <laughs> I'm just going to have to deal with that one. They scored like 30 points on Monday Night Liz. How dare you? I dared. <laughs> <laughs> Team Raziel, insert clever transition joke here. <laughs> I'm sure you'll fix that in post. It's fine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll definitely have more time when it's time to edit this episode. <laughs> Raziel used to be a human, but not a normal human. He was the most feared vampire hunter in all the world, who hunted the species to the brink of extinction. Then he died, and Raziel was resurrected and turned into a vampire himself by the vampire tyrant Cain, and together the two conquered the entire world. But then, as Nazgothi vampires do, Raziel continued to evolve and develop new powers. One day, Cain got jealous of how powerful Raziel was becoming, and so he mortally wounded him and threw him into a lake. You know running water. And so Raziel died. Again. Nowadays, Raziel is... Well, we're not really sure. You see, Raziel came back again from the dead, again, seeking revenge against (laughs) Cain and his other vampire siblings, and there's never been another being who has done this before in the history of Nazgoth, so they don't even have a word for what Raziel is. A double (laughs) vampire? A (laughs) twice-baked vampire? (laughs) Ooh, delish. Starting off in the asylum, before they've recovered any of their old upgrades, level 1 Raziel can navigate the terrain way better than his competition, due to his ability to glide through the air and his ability to become incorporeal. Whereas level 1 Alucard is a dude. He can walk around and kind of jump. Then, as these characters start recovering their various upgrades, another advantage Raziel has is that pretty much all of Alucard's upgrades are physical items, whereas Raziel's upgrades are powers that he gains from eating the souls of enemies. These powers include phasing through bars, climbing walls like a spider, tying up enemies in constricting energy coils, and using telekinesis to toss around enemies like he's playing Super Smash Brothers, and much more. Alucard has equipment, Raziel has abilities. This means not only is Alucard limited in terms of how much stuff he can carry, he can carry only one sub-weapon at a time if he wants to pick up Holy Water or the aforementioned Stopwatch, he has to leave behind his throwing daggers. But also, several Dark Souls enemies like Chaos Eaters and the Gaping Dragon can destroy equipment. That isn't to say Raziel can't use equipment. We see him wielding swords and pole arms like a pro in the first two games. Rather, by the time we hit Defiance, Raziel chooses to stop using physical weapons because he is now bonded to his very being, the most powerful magical item in all of Nazgoth, certainly better than whatever junk Alucard found lying around his dad's house, and that's the Soul Reaver. Alucard, is your sword an eight-foot-long ghost lightsaber that you somehow wield with one hand? Is your sword so cool that they named two video games after it? Is your sword the ghost of another sword? Is your sword (laughs) comprised of an infinite number of copies of yourself from different timelines? You know how sometimes you go back in time and become your own grandfather? Raziel went back in time and became his own sword. We don't have time to talk about the lore. Moving on. All you need to know is that whenever Raziel hits you with the Soul Reaver, it feels like an infinite number of copies of Raziel from different timelines punching you in the face. (laughs) In order to get a sense of how Raziel would function in the world of Dark Souls, I played some Dark Souls and then I switched over and played some Legacy of Cain Defiance. And man, oh man, it was like watching Dark Souls on two times speed. All the same basic principles apply, managing your position relative to multiple enemies at once in a 3D space, watching for tells about enemy attacks and dodging at the right moments. But Raziel is so much faster, stronger, more durable, more acrobatic, and more vicious than a Dark Souls protagonist. Raziel regularly fights off scores of golems, demons, vampire hunters, giant tentacles, or whatever, and he mops the floor with all of them. I once fought 15 shades at the same time. The main limitation for how many enemies Raziel can take on at once is not how powerful he is, but rather how many 3D models can an original Xbox render simultaneously without crashing. 
As Raziel fights, he seamlessly transitions from decapitating people with the Soul Reaver to gliding around in the air to take out airborne foes, to using telekinesis to reposition his enemies to keep from getting swarmed, and unleashing explosive elemental magical attacks that clear entire screens full of enemies at once. I also played Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and as I was playing that game, I mainly just used my sword and the one sub-weapon that I was allowed to carry at the time, because despite the fact that you get an enormous arsenal of equipment, 90% of it is totally useless outside of very specific puzzles in Dracula's castle. For instance, I was looking at the game FAQs page for this game and I saw someone ask the question, is the wolf form useful in any way? And reading the comments, the general consensus was, it sucks in combat, so apart from letting you reach one area of the castle that you only need if you want to get 100% map completion, nope. (laughs) <laughs> Additionally, some upgrades require that Alucard track down multiple magic relics before they reach full power. You need to find four different items before your bat form reaches full power, and even after that, it's terrible. Other upgrades, like Alucard's familiars, need to be leveled up through repeated use before they reach full power. When you're in a race against Raziel, you don't have time to grind in the catacombs to level your fairy. On the other hand, every upgrade Raziel gets dramatically improves his combat ability immediately. For example, Raziel can upgrade the Reaver with six different elemental powers that he could cycle between at will. Fire, water, air, earth, dark, and light. But each of these upgrades is actually multiple upgrades because each new Reaver mode also gives Raziel an additional utility power that helps him defeat enemies and solve puzzles. For instance, the Water Reaver lets him freeze enemies in ice, the Earth Reaver summons earthquakes, and the Dark Reaver lets Raziel turn invisible. Dark Souls isn't your average action game. If you go in and just try to button mash your way through it, you're going to be steamrolled within seconds. It's a game that requires caution, patience, perceptiveness, and critical thinking. It is, in a way, a thinking man's action game. And unlike Alucard, who relies more on his own brute strength and a succession of more and more powerful magical items, Raziel has a long history of being a very clever fighter. One of his earliest fights is against the vampire lord Melkaia, who possesses both massive physical strength and the ability to phase through walls. Raziel first drops support Cullis on an unsuspecting Melkaia, then tricks him into phasing into a giant meat grinder, which Raziel then activates, killing him instantly. Later, while fighting the vampire lord Rahab, Raziel shatters the windows in Rahab's sanctuary, bathing Rahab in lethal sunlight. And when Raziel goes up against the vampire lord Dumas, he tricks him into a furnace and burns him to ashes. We never see the Dark Souls protagonist use their environment in this way, so the enemies and bosses of this world will be completely unprepared for Raziel's inventiveness and ingenuity. This imbalance also extends to the difference in the way that these two characters recover from death. Alucard may be able to recover from injuries by resting in a coffin, but he's not nearly as fast at getting back on his feet as Raziel is. In one particularly egregious case in the animated series, he loses a fight to Dracula and spends one full year resting in a coffin before he's ready to go again. Raziel's method of resurrection is much faster. If he takes a lethal hit from one of Dark Souls' notorious bosses, he can pop back up in the same fight within seconds, meaning that the boss won't have time to recover. Not only that, but because Raziel only needs a corpse to possess, there's no reason for him to backtrack when respawning. He can actually continue further along in spectral form, making progress even after defeat. Alucard, however, is stuck with just crawling out of coffins he's already used, meaning that every death will inherently set him back in his progress. In fact, Raziel's method of respawning is so good that he even has the option of abandoning his body at any point to enter the spectral realm. This allows him to scout ahead, finding the locations of hidden enemies and traps and letting him plan ahead with perfect knowledge before committing to a physical approach. Additionally, the geography of the spectral realm doesn't line up 100% with its corresponding geography in the physical world. This means that an immense chasm too wide to jump or glide over in the physical world could end up being barely a crack in the pavement once you go spectral. Raziel has so many more options for traversing the landscape than Alucard does. There's no question that he'll be getting to those Lord Souls first. Alucard and Raziel are both vampires, but they're very different types of vampires. Alucard is the more traditional type, meaning he drinks blood. Now, he's actually a dompier, meaning he doesn't require blood for sustenance, but it definitely gives him strength and allows him to work at the top of his game. But most of the enemies in Dark Souls are undead. Any blood they might still have in their bodies are going to be old and lifeless, providing no real sustenance. But Raziel doesn't consume blood, he consumes souls. And what Dark Souls enemies have in abundance is right there in the title, Souls. As Liz mentioned, killing Dark Souls enemies can provide you with multiple souls at once, with many bosses having thousands of souls. This also leads to the final of Raziel's huge advantages over Alucard in this match. 
the Mega Man Advantage. That sounded like it should be capitalized. Oh, it was. Believe you me, I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> you see, while your average Dark Souls heroes, including Alucard, simply use souls to fuel level ups, once Raziel defeats a boss, he can consume their souls and gain one of their powers, just as he does in his own games. The acid breath of the gaping dragon, the pyromancy of Quelag, the crystal waves of Seath the Scaleless, Forget beating the bosses, Raziel will be a boss minutes into the journey and will only get stronger from there. Raziel is a character defined by defiance, by conquering death, the machinations of outer gods, and destiny itself. He defies the difficulty of the world of Dark Souls, and he definitely defies the sullen pretty boy who's going to end up spending more time recovering in his coffin than in actually getting the job done. Consider these Dark Souls reaved. Alright, thank you Team Raziel. We have successfully uh, killed off the opening argument section. Mm -hmm. uh, now to bring it back from the grave as the rebuttal. Oh, oh. See, and you say you had no good transitional things. <laughs> I mean, that was off the top of my head. I'm proud of it. <laughs> Team Alucard goes first in rebuttals, so uh, go for it. All right, let me get this down here. You're Raziel, stronger, more vicious. Who cares? I beat Dark Souls with a katana and a fucking loincloth. Just because your sword is amazing and big doesn't mean you need that to beat Dark Souls. Have you ever heard of a fucking speed run? You can run through Dark Souls, kill someone with a freaking billy club and wooden shield, and you could still beat the game. He's not going to be concerned trying to find his special sword. He doesn't give a shit about his equipment. You'll be off running trying to find the Soul Reaver, and meanwhile, Alucard will beat the shit out of Gravelord Nito with a fucking club. Give me a <laughs> okay. break. Well, I, I don't know what your source is on this, but I will point out you spent a decent amount of your opening argument talking about all of the upgrades that Alucard was going to get. No, I did not. Did I ever mention his sword or his shield or anything? No, I did not. Uh, Thank you, Claire. Uh, I'll have to talk about more stuff like, you know, the stopwatch or the ability to turn into a wolf that can ride a skateboard or his ability <laughs> to get familiars or that kind of Your thing. Your character's you know. whole thing is about the sword. You said it yourself. A bunch of uh -huh. games even have it in the title. You are going to find your sword. You do not yeah. know how to operate or do combat with anything but that sword. You are going to be stuck searching everywhere because shit in Dark Souls is hidden really well. You have to go off the beaten path. It will take you so much longer to find that than going straight for the bosses with whatever is at hand because Alucard knows how to adapt to situations. He has genius level intellect. And I wolf form sucks then people just aren't good enough to use it. Because again, you can beat that game with a wooden club and a wooden shield. Yes, it is possible to defeat yeah. Dark Souls wearing nothing and carrying a club. I would say that, like, the people who can do that are the people who have beaten Dark Souls many, many, many times using weapons first. And then they, like, adapt to it. You don't come out the gate able to do that sort of thing. And I would still argue it is much harder to do it in that style than by, like, collecting items, which is why it's brag worthy to do so. This is a guy who's beaten Dracula and death. I'm pretty sure Alucard doesn't need a test run. He also has a point in the game whenever he loses all of his powers and he beats a guy with just his bare fist. Like, that's what he's armed with is just his bare fist. And who is it he beats? It's somebody fairly powerful. Raziel, if he's hit once, he loses his Soul Reaver and he can only get it back if he stops to heal. That's how the Soul Reaver works in the first game, but that's not how it works in the later games. Once we get to Legacy of Cain Defiance, he can summon the Soul Reaver at any point in time, regardless of how much health he has. Thank you for those rebuttals, Team Alucard, Team Raziel. So Liz mentioned kind of briefly in her opener that Raziel is easily manipulated. There's no one in Dark Souls that ever tries to manipulate you. Like, they all just kind of like hang out in dark hallways and then like try to kill you when you run close. There's no like grand puppet master going on. Like, none of the villains are especially manipulative and Alucard certainly isn't going to do the job. The world of Dark Souls is extremely dark and terrible and terrifying. There are things in it that will scare the shit out of you. Now, Raziel is a damaged soul. He'll probably see something that looks sort of like Cain, and he'll be like, oh my god, I'm done. <laughs> and he'll make out with it. He'll go down. <laughs> yeah, sure, that would distract him. And then he'd go down some dark hallway and get into the fetal position and cry the rest of the time because he can't find his sword. Have you seen the world of Nazgoth? Like, it's called 
fucking Nas God. Anyone who looks like Kane is also going to kind of look like Dracula. So I feel like, you know, when it comes to like having an emotional breakdown at seeing this dark memory from your past, right. like that's a bean on either side of the scale, if you ask me. I mean, to be fair, Claire, I'm pretty sure I knew some people in high school who went around calling themselves Nas God. It doesn't make them scary. <laughs> Do we mention the giant who's made of stitched together corpses who faces through solid matter and the giant spider vampires and like I'm sorry I mean, what is that as scary as you know your dad not thinking you're good enough <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just don't think it part. is Alucard beats Dracula eventually but in the storyline of both Castlevania 3 and in the animated series, Alucard realizes that his father is about to wage war on humanity, and he decides to go in a coffin and enter into a slumber for years in the hopes that a real hero will find him and help him, because he knows that he's not even close to up to the challenge of taking on Dracula by himself. Except that he beat Dracula single-handedly in Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I mean, eventually he, like, gets there, but oh, again, but like, did. his first option oh, is to, did. like, hang out in a coffin and just wait for... For stuff to blow over or wait for someone more competent to come by. Hey, man, he knows to wait and to make sure that he gets it right on the first time. Just like Tactical. he knows he can beat it with a wooden club and shield <laughs> on the first try. I also try. want to introduce you to the idea that perhaps hanging out in a coffin was ye olde version of Tinder. <laughs> and it's just waiting for the right person to open the coffin. And like, that's how you know who's going to be like your party to defeat your dad. So swiping right is supposed to like mime the motion of pulling aside a coffin lid to like see who's underneath. Is that what, what you're getting <laughs> I'm at? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Is this an app called COFFN? Mm. Yes. As much as I want to hear more about the feelings coming from both sides, <laughs> that will do it for rebuttals. And stop me if you've heard this one before, but it seems like both Raziel and Alucard have reached the kill and love the first flame at the same damn uh. time. This is my shocked face. <laughs> <laughs> but now, of course, they have a choice to make. Do they throw themselves into the flame to keep the Age of Fire sputtering along for a little while longer, or let it go out altogether to allow the next stage to begin? It's a fascinating moral question that we don't have to fucking answer because it turns out there's a third option. The lightning oh, round! Wow. Who are you? Raziel asks. Who am I? The figure asks. Who am I? I am Luis Alfonso Villasenor Olvera, television producer extraordinaire, you ignorant undead troglodytes. And you have come very close to ruining my entire season. Why couldn't you just do this together? You know, road trip, buddy movie. They start off as enemies, but end up becoming friends. Wacky hijinks result in that strong male bonding that audiences go crazy for. But no, you two had to do everything alone. I go to all the trouble of getting you into that cell, letting you out of that cell, giving you a personal fucking encyclopedia to spell out the fucking situation to the both of you, and you go your separate ways. I kept waiting and waiting for you to meet up again and figure out you needed each other, which would have spiked the hell out of the ratings, but you never did. And now, who has to figure out a way to salvage this? Who has to come in and save the day? Me, as usual. Alucard cocks his head. I'm sorry, I, I don't really- Shut up, pretty boy! You are literally only here for the 18 to 29 female demographic. <laughs> Your opinion does not matter! <laughs> Sir, Raziel says, I don't like this man much either, but surely that was somewhat harsh. Wasn't talking to you either, Dr. Caligari! <laughs> Alright, how do we do this? How- A sudden grin flashes over Olvera's face. You know what? You are still going to help me. Gather round, crew, we are taking a hard pivot on this one. The kiln of the first flame suddenly fills with the sounds of rustling and chatter as camera people, makeup artists, gaffers, and screenwriters suddenly appear out of the woodwork. These two don't want to make drama together? We're going to force them. Monica, clean these losers up. Aaron, cancel the after party. We're not done here yet. Jerry, get on the horn to New York. I want a four-bedroom condo rented out for the next three months. We are going to ape the shit out of that New Zealander guy's show, and we are going to do it goddamn right. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? No, make it a five-bedroom condo. Fuck it, we're going full friends all over this shit. Sarah, get in touch with Netflix and Amazon. See if we can get them into another bidding war. This has high concept written all over it. And you four, he screams, find me some more cast members! Advocates, I have in front of me a list of 13 other fictional characters who have in some way appeared in Smash fiction or metafiction. Curated by me for no specific reason aside from my own amusement. <laughs> 
Each team will choose one of them. Then I will choose a third one. Ah. Along with Raziel and Alucard, these will be the central cast for a new roommate sitcom. Once we have the characters in place, each team will give me their pitch for how the first season of this show goes and why their character will be the standout of the bunch, do extremely well with test audiences, and have his own spinoff by the end of the year. The characters available to you are Blade from Marvel Comics, hmm. Celine from Underworld, Ooh. Smiling Jack from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, Ooh. Buffy Summers from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. Yeah. Xena from Xena Warrior Princess. Ooh. Jack Harkness from Doctor Who. Mm. Tulip O'Hare from Preacher. Mm. Dracula, the dead and loving it version. Yeah! I hate, I hate that guy. <laughs> Dana Scully from The X-Files. Aslan from The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh -oh. Or Peter Lowe from Vampire's Kiss. Yeah! <laughs> oh, man. All right, Liz, I'm pretty happy to go with the character that you're interested in. <laughs> I kind of figured that was the direction we had to go. Where are we going with this? Oh, Liz wants Smiling Jack. All right, Smiling Jack is in the house. What are you feeling, Dan? Man, oh man. I think my vote's oh. for Scorpion. If that is your wish. <laughs> I mean, that's what I want. That is fine. All right. <laughs> All right. From Team Alucard, we have Smiling Jack from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. And from Team Raziel, we have Scorpion from Mortal Kombat. And from me. You know what? I'm going with Xena. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a good choice. Team Alucard went first during the main round, so Team Raziel will be going first during the lightning round. Team Raziel, pitch me. Okay. We have a, an interesting left turn that this show takes pretty much right out of the gate, Miles. Okay. This starts off as a typical real-world style reality show. So, you know, everyone's living in the same house. We just, like, have cameras, like, kind of capturing the most interesting moments out of any given space of time. But that premise gets abandoned by episode two. Because <laughs> the first episode, there's a lot of focus on how Alucard's hair is clogging up the bathroom sink. Uh, sure. Scorpion keeps like trying to grab objects like, you know, his his like can of Coke or like the Xbox controller from across <laughs> the room using his his harpoon. And that just uh -huh. inevitably results in literally everything in the house breaking. Smiling Jack keeps trying to mansplain stuff about vampires to everyone. <laughs> and I feel like at the center of it, you know, Raziel is the like put upon every man. He's like the good roommate. He like does all the dishes. And, um, <laughs> you know, Scorpion and Smiling Jack are really messy, as you might imagine. And Alucard just more like doesn't give a shit <laughs> and just like, like side eyes. Everybody's like, all right, I'm going. And then just like walks away. He's like, are you going to get those dishes? And then he's like, just leaves. <laughs> so yeah, Zena is like relatively aloof through most of this, but eventually she does get very tired of everyone's shit and starts drop kicking everyone else, which then <laughs> leads to Scorpion challenging her to a fight. So by the start of episode two, we have a tournament reality show. <laughs> At the end of every episode, someone gets eliminated from the show. Okay, A and from the physical world yes, because right. they get yes <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, you know, they all end up coming back eventually, like mid-season. Yeah, they're undead. They just come back from dead eventually, and so it's it's great. We say that, you know, Raziel wins an early victory against Smiling Jack, and uh, after he eats his soul, he gains one of his powers, which in his case is just, like, completely unearned confidence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, Raziel starts becoming really popular because he stops, like, being too polite to say all the stuff that's on his mind and just, like, gets, like, really good at zingers. Okay. Um, and so after that point, he becomes, like, uh, a really great breakout character. When he's, like, being quiet and just, like, rolling his eyes or whatever, it makes for a lot of, like, good reaction gifts or people go, like, you know, big mood or Raziel is all of us, yeah. like, that kind of thing. And, like, as the show goes on and Raziel keeps winning these fights, he keeps draining the souls of his roommates and gaining their <laughs> best traits, which is not like, you know, fire breath or telekinesis or whatever. It's like he gets... Alucard's gorgeous blonde hair and oh, his no. female fan base and also uh, <laughs> his jawline in that he gets a jaw which he didn't have before. <laughs> he uh, he gets Xena's thigh strength and her yelling voice. Um, yeah, 
And Raziel already has very good thighs to begin yeah, with. Yeah, he does like a lot of crouching. So, you know, yeah. really, really works that, that muscle group. When you take Scorpion Soul, he also gets those squatting abilities, <laughs> That's as true, we know. As, as we've established. <laughs> I was going to say uh, he gets Scorpion's cooking abilities because there's an obscure video you can unlock in one of the Mortal Kombat games of cooking with Scorpion, where he shows you how to cook uh, cupcakes, I think. So uh-huh, anyway. I remember yeah. that, actually. Yeah. The biggest fashion trend for the year is, of course, cowls. Everybody starts wearing cowls to look more like <laughs> yeah. having your jaw uncovered in public is like a big faux pas. Yeah, so. absolutely. It becomes like hats, you know, back in the 50s. Yeah. But by the end, you know, as Claire mentioned, one of the like memes that goes around with Raziel is Raziel is all of us. And by the end, like that takes on a completely different meaning because like Raziel has taken all of these disparate parts of these incomplete people and he's shown how you can like meld them together to become a better person. So, yeah, that's uh, that's how that particular reality show ends. I like how he gains the power of a strong jawline and yet keeps it hidden. Doesn't want to brag about it. <laughs> um, he just pulls out every once in a while. You like get little glimpses of it. And people are like, oh, that jawline. I mean, that's yeah. really what Smiling Jack is doing, right? Like he has a good jawline, but he keeps it hidden under that beard. And, you know, I suppose killing all the other members of the cast is one way to ensure that you're <laughs> the one who gets the spinoff. So. <laughs> Default, the two greatest words in the English language. All right, Team Alucard, I'm terrified. <laughs> let, let me hear it. I don't, I, I, I'm really I mean, scared. So, Miles, this well, may not surprise you, but we're fairly chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> it is a show in which these people live in the house together, and I want you to understand that one of the tropes of this show is that Alucard spends a lot of time in the bathroom, and he comes out of the bathroom in a towel constantly, once per episode, and he always drops the <laughs> towel at a suitably dramatic moment. <laughs> and you just see his beautiful moonlit ass once per show. And like people have made like gift compilations of all the times the towel has dropped. And like they're shared all over the Internet. It's amazing. I like to imagine he just like finds the one spot in the apartment where there's a beam of moonlight coming in through the window. <laughs> if we named these episodes after quotes from the show, like Bob and I do with Next Wrestling Fan, this one would totally be called his beautiful full moon lit ass. <laughs> <laughs> so you think the tension in this show is going to be between Zena and Alucard, but it turns out that the tension is actually between Alucard and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so Alucard at first is really into Zena, but then there's this one night whenever Raziel comes home and he's really sad and then he and Alucard end up getting drunk together and then they end up sleeping together. But only Raziel remembers, oh my god, the drama. And so Alucard just thinks he and Raziel had a great heart to heart and that he just feels really good the next day. He's like, oh, that's pleasant. <laughs> and But Raziel's like, oh, Oh no, but I feel like I have feelings for him. And then <laughs> Smile and Jack starts getting jealous of the fact that Alucard's being all nice to Raziel. And he feels like, oh man, I'm going to turn this young vampire around. He needs like a strong influence, but also like I'm kind of into you. So he asks him on a date and then Alucard's like, oh yeah, fine, I'll go on a date with you. And then, but Alucard keeps checking his phone and it's messages from Scorpion who's asking, who used all the goddamn conditioner in this house? <laughs> I need it for my skull. <laughs> <laughs> So Alucard's like, you know what? I'm going to cut this date short because I have to go and like fight this guy. And then he gets there. And then Liz, do you want to talk about what happens? (laughs) So Alucard gets back to the apartment and sees Scorpion getting ready to fight Raziel in the ring in the apartment. He watches the fight and unfortunately Raziel loses and he becomes emo in the corner. Smiling Jack happened to be Raziel's coach and somehow... Got back there. But unbeknownst to Raziel, Smiling Jack fixed the match at the request of Xena! And he poisoned Raziel's Gatorade! (laughs) Alucard caught wind of this and punched Scorpion right out of the 50th story window. The winner of that previous fight was to face Alucard, and Alucard only wanted the best to face him. He then goes and confronts Xena. What the fuck, Xena? And punches her out the 51st story window. (laughs) Alucard goes over to Raziel and picks him up by his weird cape pauldron thing and says, Kid, you're better than this. Let's go face your supposed coach. They approach Smiling Jack who just goes, <laughs> It's all a mistake, guys. I just needed some hooch money, you know? <laughs> they both punch Smiling Jack out the 52nd story window. <laughs> Alucard and Raziel then start hanging out. And their friendship spawns a series of t-shirts showing their intense brotherhood they have with each other. And then there's also that subset that makes t-shirts of a different kind. Yeah. Right. I have all of them. The bobs of the world. (laughs) Except, except, then Raziel poisons Alucard's Gatorade. (laughs) And Raziel challenges Alucard to an instant duel, thinking he can win. 
So they fight in the multiple story apartments uh, wrestling ring, and even though poisoned, Alucard is able to cause Raziel to trip over his beloved costume's cake, sending him careening out the 53rd story window. <laughs> Alucard becomes the breakout star simply because he is the only one left alive and broke a lot of people out through windows. <laughs> That's why he becomes the breakout star. But I think it's important to know what kind of breakout star he is because people uh-huh. haven't forgotten how much they loved those early days whenever it was all just like carefree fucks. And so <laughs> we're seeing like a sex in the city type show. It's a throwback. It's ju- yeah, it's Alucard going shopping and then wearing interesting shoes and then drinking uh, other probably Prosecco yeah, on his Prosecco. bed and writing in his journal. And, you know, yeah. And saying, why do I always date the wrong people? You know, why do I, I just want to find people some- out windows? <laughs> yeah, I just want to find somebody I can share a coffin with. Why can't people just appreciate me and all of my vampiric weirdness and also the fact that I'm a serial murderer <laughs> my own windows? <laughs> and then people, like, gets really popular and uh, a lot of people, he has, like, he gets other people in the show as well and people start saying, oh, are you an Alucard? And they go like, oh, I wish I was an Alucard. <laughs> and then there's a movie and it's all a thing. <laughs> they call it Drank in the city. Perfect. Drank? Like drank? blood? Like drinking blood drank in the city? Oh, drank. Or like <laughs> How about thirst in the thirst city? Thirst in the city. Ooh, yeah. thirst in the Malachi's city. Alucard's a thirsty boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. That was a disaster. If, that, no, that was wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I hope that all the children listening to this podcast have taken away the message that violence always solves everything. <laughs> so I am going to go uh, figure out somehow who won this match. Have fun, talk amongst yourselves about things that I have no context for. (laughs) So, Bob, you were talking early in your opening argument about how Alucard hated his dad so much that he decided to, like, make his name the backwards version of his dad's name. And for some reason in my head, I just got this image of him being like, I hate you, dad. I'm going to make my name your name backwards. So instead of dad, I'm going to (laughs) be... (laughs) <laughs> oh, never mind. Instead of, and then he goes off of there. That was a very stupid thing goes, that I had in my head. He goes back to his coffin and sulks. That's right. That's why he spent all that time in the coffin. He was trying to come up with a better name. He was trying to figure out how to spell Dracula backwards. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was so going to yell at you, Dan, because you were saying that, like, oh, after he fought his dad, he spent a year in his coffin. He spent a year in that coffin because his dad hurt him emotionally. Oh, he sure did. I mean, the ending of the animated series wrecks me. <laughs> I saw the first season. I haven't seen the second one. It's okay. so good, Bob. Right. Well, I'm curious, out of all of these three things that we researched which one had the most confusing lore? Mm. Uh, are you asking me? Uh, sure, yeah. Because you're you're like a newbie to all these, right? I'm very the newbie. Um, yes. I did not research Dark Souls at all. <laughs> because I trusted that your Cliff Notes version would be sufficient. And you got Liz for that, yeah. Yeah. I got about, oh, five paragraphs into the stuff about Raziel, and I was having flashbacks to Pulse Lassies and researching <laughs> uh, lightning. The Castlevania stuff made some sense. It didn't seem bonkers. They both seemed like if I was in it, it would make sense, but oh man, it was just a pile of fucking words, because there was obviously deep mythology with Soul Reaver. Soul Reaver was like a soap opera to me. I was like, oh my god, now this person and this person, I'm jealous of people. Ah! I liked it. And I was like, totally it's, it's unclear nonsense. about the relationship with Kane. I was like, obviously, you have really strong feelings about him. Are they I want to be with you feelings? Are they I want you to approve of me feelings? Like, what are these feelings? So I will say that um, the uh, Raziel and Kane relationship stuff is one of the first internet fandoms that I stumbled <gasps> upon. It's it's very unintentional on the part of the creators, but it's <laughs> so there in the subtext. It's like they, Ooh, these two have yeah. a very a very passionate relationship with one another that alternates between um, allies and enemies. That's where all the good fucking is. Yeah, I have no doubt that AO3 will just be chock full of Raziel and Kane stuff. You know what? There's not actually that many that I'm finding. I'm shocked. I mean, I feel like it's not an especially well-known video game series nowadays. Like, I feel like its yeah. popularity has probably waned since it originally came out. I will put it this way. When I was a teenager and just searching for 
wholesome uh, <laughs> uh, Legacy of Kane fandom content. Yeah, right. That was not what I found. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's just one that just says... <laughs> Kane and Raziel share and shares in quotations a moment and moment is in quotations. Oh no! I did play Dark Souls for the first time to try to prep for this though, and that game is very hard, Liz. I don't know if you're aware of this. I got killed by the same two fucking skeletons like ten times, and I was not happy about it. Skeleton one and skeleton two. I love Dark Souls and I love super hard video games. Dan can attest to that. Oh yeah, for sure. I love super hard video games too. I have beaten a lot of super hard video. Video games, but not Dark Souls. But not Dark Souls yet. I only played it a little bit and got killed by two skeletons ten times, and then I left. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but my character was a lady with a cowl, and I realized afterwards she looked like a lady version of Raziel because when she's undead, she had bluish skin. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I wasn't kidding. Go. Dark Souls 3, I beat it with no armor and just a two-handed katana. The entire game. And then I ran through my friends. The entire game with just that guy. I called him Rolo because all I would do is roll dodge. Mm. The less armor you wear, the faster you are. It's amazing. It sounds amazing. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm back. Hope you had a good conversation. So this was a really interesting match, and I learned a lot, as usual, with these kind of things. But the more I thought about it, the more it became pretty clear to me what kind of situation this was. Because I feel like what we've got here is a real tortoise in the hair kind of game. Because, mm. like, I'm looking over my notes for Alucard, and the motherfucker is rolling with shape changing and fireballs. Like Bob said, a literal storm of swords. The dude be Dracula. He's just getting shit left and right. Raziel is going to be just kind of like slowly like doing his thing, gaining his powers, going into the spirit form. But the thing is, is that from what I understand about Alucard, as opposed to Raziel, he's kind of this like powerhouse badass, but a monster knocks out one of his pieces of equipment or manages to kill him and puts him back in one of his coffins or something like that. It's not the hair in that, like, he's not getting arrogant and, like, stopping, but he will encounter setbacks, I think, that might allow Raziel to catch up because, as Team Raziel mentioned, Raziel, even when he dies, can continue traversing, you know, the terrain and stuff. So I feel like it's going to be that kind of thing where, like, Alucard blazes forward in the blaze of glory and then, like, has to stop and Raziel just catch up and Alucard plays the glory has to stop Raziel catches up I think that the point that Dark Souls is a thinking game and Raziel is a thinking character was kind of reinforced by both sides and in the end the tortoise wins the race man I'm giving it to Raziel yes Oh. When you said that, Miles, you're like, it's like the tortoise in the hair. I'm like, wait, are we the hair? Are we the tortoise? <laughs> What's going on? And it's like, work through the thing. Like, I mean, oh, man. Liz and I won yeah. the moonlit ass competition. You so. absolutely You did. guys definitely won the lightning round. <laughs> there you go. That's wow. All about. With our postmodern take on narrative. Yeah, basically. You, you guys did a tremendous job. You really, really yeah. did. That was well thought, both of you. I learned a lot listening to you guys' argument. Well, good. <laughs> That's what this show is primarily about, education. You did a good job, Bob. Aw, uh, you did amazing. You guys did what I needed you to do, which is describe your character sexually <laughs> and just, like, go fucking nuts during the lightning round. So <laughs> I'd like to think we all won. Yeah, I yes. feel like I have seen Alucard's moonlit ass at this point. Like, I have a very clear <laughs> mental image in my head. Mm, was this about vampire butt? Ah, uh, I see. I've summoned Kit. <laughs> what do you wish to be? Oh, right, Kit, thanks. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, Kit, but as we've established, Along with both characters in this match, you are a vampire. Indeed. I was too busy eating pigeons and cockroaches to be here tonight. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you know, like a vampire. Tom, foe, good thanks. Over to Twitter. Thank you to the strange smell you occasionally walk through. Oh. Mm. Fat 69. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fat blood 69. Ah! Oh. Vander Turner, Florian, Icon Jade, Sean Boyd, Cosplay Devotee, Cosplay Fiend, Cool Down Now, JTFJ2, Forte Body, Sid Rabbit Bug, Spencer Kenning, Fresh Pramp of 30 to 50 Feral Hogs, <laughs> 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 Fake Scott Kersey, Alexander, and Jeff Rick Present. Over to Tumbles, thank you to Ultra Anonymous Angel, Secretly a Skeleton, Shh, Sid Rabbit Blog, Vale Mochi, Hi, new person. Not Very Bright Raven, Changing Shades, Ink the Cryptid, and Little Keep It Bale, you're back. And on Facebook, thank you to Andy Hunt, Viola Sanderlin, Jeff Polier, Hayden Reynolds, Robert Ramsey, and Jeffrey Ketchum. And thanks also to Luis Alfonso Villasenor Olvera, who is, of course, the most talented visionary 
maverick filmmaker in the entire nameless land of Dark Souls. His methods are unorthodox. But he, damn it, he gets results. He makes some damn fine reality TV in which multiple people are punched out of 50-story windows. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we thank him for that, and also for being a patron of ours over at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast, which is why he was worked into the narrative, and why many more of our patrons are going to be worked into the narrative in these, our upcoming episodes. So look forward to all of that, as well as all the bonus content you get for going on there, too. I honestly can't believe how many patrons we're going to have to bring into the narrative in the last episode of this show. Oh, really? I, Are there... I thought we were going to run out like yeah. a year ago. Oh, no, no. I've I've been pacing it. We will have one or two per episode for the rest of the show. Oh, wow. Yeah, at least. Yeah. Like, we're going to have to, like, squeeze them all into the Smash Bash. It's amazing. I am shocked we have gone this entire show. Totally. Like, without running out of we patrons. We have a lot. So, it's, yeah. It's... yeah, you guys are fucking awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Smash Fiction. Next week, a very spooky episode of Shipwrecked. Smash Fiction is produced by Miles Schneiderman and production assistant Sharon Schneiderman with logo design by Claire Mulcairin. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod of the Clan McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Hitman. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. Can you give us a few extra minutes? Because we literally came up with the same thing. Oh, all right. Yeah. So one second. Wow. For the sake of the show, we wanted to have variety. So one sec. Wait, so you guys also decided to kill everybody else in the house? Yes. In in a tournament? Because like, you know. No, tournament was absolutely sort of part of it. All right. I mean, I think that just means that we objectively came to the correct decision. Both of us. We need to bring back the scream when the lightning round comes. I've been screaming, man. Yeah, everybody. Uh, yeah.